So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I'm really thrilled to be able to bring to you today, Jay Mata, who is a certified financial planner, which is the highest designation in the industry. Welcome, Jay. Hello, how are you? <laughs> good, good. I wanna tell everyone a little bit about you, if you don't mind. So Jay is proudly married with two daughters and two sons, and he was born and raised in the Bronx. After high school, he enlisted in the US Marines and later served again in the Army National Guard. His career in financial services began in 1997. He studied financial services at NYU and has a degree in business. Athletically, he runs the New York City, Chicago, Boston, and Marine Corps marathons. It's his mission to be a resource, to create value in the lives of others. He's continuously working to improve himself so that he can help as many people as possible in all areas. He is disciplined and governed by his principles. His clients work with him because he takes time to educate them about planning for their financial needs and concerns, whether it's saving money, getting ready to retire or discussing insurance. It's his objective to help his clients prepare for whatever may happen in their lives. Ultimately, he works with his clients as a resource to fulfill their needs and expectations. And his own agenda is not a part of that. He's committed to his practice. Recently, he was awarded the number one financial services representative in the country for two consecutive years, otherwise always finishing with the top one percentile. He's published, he's been published as a columnist regularly and regarding financial matters. <laughs> Outside of his professional work, he was nationally recognized for his involvement in the community. The Building Blocks Foundation is a nonprofit he started that serves the homeless youth attending New York City public schools. Very proud to have you here, Jay. And thank you for joining us and educating us on how to invest in these turbulent times. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to get my uh, slides up here. Um, Jay was sharing with me that today he was actually doing quite a quite a ton of charitable work. So he it's not just talk, it's action. Literally uh, spent the since six o'clock this morning moving thousands of blankets amongst New, New York City public schools. So um, yeah, it's one of the worst in my nonprofit. But thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that warm introduction. Um, it's always very kind of you. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, you know, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, Elizabeth will be monitoring them. And, uh, you know, if she, if she can, she'll stop me and we'll, we'll answer it as we go. Um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. But uh, all in all, uh, again, my name is Jay Moda. Um, I'm a New York native. Uh, I have a financial planning uh, team here in New York, New Jersey, and I have an office in Chicago. And this presentation today, uh, based on investing in turbulent times, you know, was originally created back in March uh, when the market was um, expected to go a little bit crazy, and it did, and it's been a little bit um, hectic ever since. But given the coronavirus, uh, it's caused a lot of panic and uncertainty, and everybody's dealing with it in different ways. So I think it's a good presentation. Um, certainly the presentation is not meant to give anybody advice specifically. Um, in my decades of doing this business, I've never found anyone uh, to be the same, never two clients to be exactly the same. So, um, you know, I want you to understand that this information is that just information, but if you have a question, feel free to ask and I will try to do my best to answer it. So moving on here. The markets, whenever we see things that are happening in the market, uh, let me see if I can move these controls here, get them out of the way. Um, uh, I'm just trying to move these controls so I can see the screens. I apologize, give me one second here. All right. So with the anxiety in the markets, it, a lot of it's created by the media. And um, the market is supply and demand. When a lot of people are buying the prices and you see the market go up, when a lot of people go down, uh, when a lot of people sell, you see the market going down. And there's really three types of investors. Uh, typically you have two types of investors, but there's three types of investors that we're dealing with in the market today. 
And now you have your new retail investors, you have retail investors that have been doing it for many, many years, and then your institutional investors like the banks and large uh, companies. So the new retail investors are, you know, those are people that since being home with COVID, seeing maybe opportunity in the market because prices were very low on stocks. Maybe they started, you know, investing. Maybe you know people that opened up accounts and started investing while they were at home. Um, and they are the new retail um, investors that we see driving a lot of volatility in the market. The people who are seasoned investors, they're a little bit less emotional sometimes, although emotions do set in and anxiety uh, sets in and then can cause them to make you know, sporadic moves, which drives volatility, uh, which creates anxiety. And institutional investors generally are uh, a little bit more steadfast and a, a lot more disciplined than say the, the um, retail investors are. So today's agenda, we're gonna talk about an overview of what we have in the current market. We're gonna talk about volatility basics, and we're gonna talk about tips for investing in markets like this where, where you have a lot of volatility. And honestly, given the advent of electronic trading, uh, algorithmic uh, trading done through algorithms, um, I see volatility not going away anytime soon. If anything, it may increase more. So. Let's talk about volatility and what creates volatility. If you look at the chart here, you'll see that there are many things that have happened since 2009, which has created either a spike or a dip in the market. But what I want you to take away from this chart, I mean, we can go through all of them, right? So 2009, you have the post-financial crisis where the S&P closed at a low of 676. Um, you have the credit rating of the US government being downgraded. Uh, then you have the S&P uh, moving up over 2,000. Uh, you have presidents being elected, UK, EU re referendums. Um, you know, there's so many things that you see here. But what, you, what I want you to look at is over the past 10 to 11 years, if you were to draw a line through all of these points, you would see there's an incline in the market, right? And this leads us into what we're going to talk a little bit about time horizon, because if you are emotional and you make a quick movement, you can lose opportunity. And what I want you to realize is that, yeah, the market may dip. As we saw a dip in March and uh, the onset of COVID, when it really started to hit, we saw the market take a, a significant dip. I think it was March 24th, if my memory serves me correctly. But then it, it, it bounced back up significantly, right? And there's no telling what's gonna make the market bounce, if it's gonna come back. Everybody was predicting an L-shaped recovery, you know, meaning that it was gonna drop and then it would kind of stay flat. But we kind of saw like a V-shape uh, almost uh, recovery where the market took a, a dive when COVID uh, and everything shut down. And then it kind of inched back up and now we see, you know, markets closing at all times high. So over time, you're going to have volatility. The key is don't let that drive your decisions. There are other things that you want to focus on to drive your decisions on whether you should buy into the market, sell, hold, etc. So here are some factors that have influenced the market over the past couple of decades, right? You have Black Monday, the market crash in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, uh, you have the savings and loan scandals, the 2000s, you have the dot-com bubble. September 11th, we had SARS, which was another norovirus uh, pandemic. It wasn't as bad as COVID, but still considered to be a pandemic. Um, corporate accounting scandals like Enron, et cetera. Um, and then the last decade, oil prices very low. You have the China currency devaluation. Uh, Brexit, inflation, and now the coronavirus, all of these things have major influences on the market. So the first thing we're going to talk about or the first discipline to really focus on, and this is key, people ask all the time, well, in my IRA, should I take the money out of stocks and should I put it in cash? Uh, my 401k, what should I do? Uh, I have investments, should I sell my investments, etc. And the question I always ask is, well, two questions. One is, when, what's the money going to be used for? And when do you need to use it for that purpose? So most people save for retirement. If you're 20, 30 years old, you have maybe 30 years, 40 years, 
to a retirement? Are you necessarily concerned about the market today? You know, you shouldn't be concerned about the market today. You should stay the course because you have such a long period of time. And on that previous slide where you saw the incline, the market continually going up, it, it's in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to affect you. So time horizon is extremely important. Obviously, if you have a short-term time horizon, one to four years, that's when you have to worry about putting money into safety and being more liquid. That means you want your money to be in cash and or bonds. Midterm, if you're going to retire or you need the money, if you have a major purchase or your child's going to college or whatever the case may be in five or seven years, maybe you want to be in a moderate to a safe type of growth uh, vehicle. And again, cash bonds, large capitalized stocks, blue chip stocks, blue chip stocks, you know, are they tend to move less. Uh, not saying you can't lose money, but they don't have tremendous spikes as maybe some of the smaller companies do. Uh, and then if you have over eight years, long term, I really consider 10 years, but this chart here says eight years. Um, you know, you have the ability to take on more risk, risk versus reward, right? So the more risk you take, you should get uh, the uh, eligibility for a greater reward. So if you have a longer time horizon, you should be affording to take a little bit more risk. And really, it the money that you have in the market or that you're investing, there should be separate buckets of money depending on when you need the money. So you don't want to commingle retirement money with money that you're going to use to buy a house, or you don't want to commingle, you know, something that you're saving for a long period of time. Uh, and, you know, with funds that you need in five years, you want to have separate buckets of those money so you can monitor the investments and really make sure that you're properly allocated. This chart I, I really like. And what I'll say about this chart is typically the retail investor, whether it be a new retail investor or an old retail investor, and a retail investor is those individuals that are trading themselves on uh, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, you name it. Um, you know, typically they're behind the power curve on this. And you know, when we look at the markets, the markets are cyclical. Uh, starting off on the left, if you're looking at your screen, you have optimism. That's when the market's starting to go up. You hit the peak, and that's the euphoria. That's when the market's at an all-time high. Everybody's happy. And then, you know, you start to decline a little bit, and that's when the fear starts to set in. And then you hit the bottom, and that's when people surrender. And typically, the institutional investors, investors that use professionals, um, they have a, a better advantage on this because they're working with someone that's doing research. And that research keeps them more in tune to these cycles that the market goes through. The retail investor that's doing it on their own, they, they generally get in the news late. So by the time the market is in euphoria, you think it's optimism, so you're buying in, but the market's really at a peak, but you think it's here, so you're buying in. Little do you know you're buying at a high price because you don't realize the market may be at a peak. And then they start to go down and then they freak out. And then they at the surrender point at an all time low is when they sell. Um, and that's because they get emotional. And again, they forget what the purpose of the money is. And that's the all time sin, right? The all time sin is you don't want to buy high and sell low. You want to buy low and sell high if you need to sell. Um, but oftentimes we see a lot of people they buy when the market's hot and the prices are very expensive. And then the market comes down because it is cyclical. It could be cyclical over a four year period, a five year period, 10 year period. You know, we've been on a bull run pretty much since the, the, the Great Recession, but um, meaning the market's been going up with a few declines, but the market's been consistently going up. We've been experiencing a bull market. So, you know, no one knows where the top is and there's no crystal ball. This is why you either have to do a ton of research or you should work with a professional um, that can guide you because you know, as a professional, we do the research or we have people that do the research that we talk to and we listen to and we, we read the information on. So we may have a little bit of an insight, but it is a, you know, it's the market should never be timed, but just keep in mind that typically people buy high and sell low and that's, that's the worst. So let's talk about what the poorly timed decisions are or were. Um, let me just uh, move this so I can see here. So if we look at the average annual returns, this is over a decade, 1999 
till 2018, okay? Inflation, we, we basically look at inflation as the cost of goods. So uh, when you say 2.17%, you know, we typically as financial advisors and, and financial planners, when we do our planning, we account for 3% inflation. And that's because if you would go back and you averaged out inflation since the Great Depression back in 1929 up until today, um, the, the, it, the inflation, the average inflation is 3.17%. So we use 3%. Some years you have little in inflation, some years you have a lot of inflation. Right now we don't see much inflation, but why is inflation important? Real quick example, if you have $100 today and you keep that money in cash, under your blanket or wherever you keep that hundred dollars because you don't want to invest it because you're afraid to lose money and inflation keeps moving, right? Next year, just by this example, if I'm rounding off numbers, if inflation was at 2.17%, which it was average over the past 10 years, your hundred dollars next year is going to buy you 98 dollars uh, worth of goods because you've lost 2%. It's actually going to be a little bit less and be like 97.83. Uh, sense is what that's going to buy you because you lost 2.17%. So the number one goal for investing is to outpace inflation. That's why people invest in the first place so that they can maintain a purchasing power so that their money maintains pace with inflation. Obviously, if you have goals, you invest your money a certain way to achieve a goal by receiving a return. So if you have X amount of dollars that you're saving and you need a greater amount of money, well, based upon your contributions, the other factor is how much money your money is going to earn. And so that's going to really dictate what type of investments you use. But overall, you want to you want to outpace inflation. And so looking at this here, the S&P index, which is an is an, the one of the largest index of the 500 largest companies, Tesla was just uh, brought on to the S&P 500. Um, but if you look at over the past 10 years or, or two, uh, 1999 through the end of 2018, that decade, uh, the S&P index averaged 5.62%. So if you just put your money in the S&P index in a fund or whatever, uh, you would have made 5.62%. Inflation being 2.17, congratulations, you did a good job. You uh, achieved uh, greater than the inflation. So your money maintained purchasing power. Um, keep in mind, there are taxes there that would affect that as well. So you have to look at both taxation and inflation. But for, for this example, it's important to understand inflation and why you should invest uh, in certain ways. The average stock fund investor, so the retail investor, those people that do it themselves, their average return was 3.88. So they barely beat, you know, they did beat inflation. So they did their job, but they did less than the overall market. So if they looked at the S&P 500 as a benchmark, and a lot of investments will benchmark, meaning they use the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or other indexes, they use it as a benchmark to gauge how well they did. So the average investor in this decade didn't do as good as the market itself. With no manipulation, the market did better than the person trying to time the market and make stock trades. If you look at the person, uh, you look at bonds now, and if you look at the, the bond index, the bond index did 4.55%, which is again, double the inflation rate. So you, again, even if you invested in bonds, you exceeded what the inflation was. However, those retail folks and the do-it-yourselfers, and it's nothing against that, but you have to do your, 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 your research, they didn't beat inflation. So essentially they lost money over the 10 year period because they, they averaged less than a quarter percent return. And therefore their value of money went down and the risk of purchasing power has affected them and they can't buy as much money uh, to, and at the end of the 10 years that they could have in the beginning of the 10 years. So understanding the reason why people invest and understanding you know, um, the effects of the market itself without manipulation and then people trying to manipulate by, by investing. Uh, let's see here. So- The question that perhaps you can address is, who is the average, um, Danita asked, who is the average bond fund investor? Yeah, so again, the, the bond fund investors, you have, you have stocks, you have bonds, you have ETFs. There are several types of investments. Bonds are generally debt uh, that you lend money to. So you can lend money to governments, you can lend money to corporations, you can lend money to municipalities. Uh, just depends on the type of bond that you're buying. 
Um, but people buy bonds all the time. So, you know, if you have a 401k and you get a balanced fund, right, that mutual fund has bonds and it has stocks in there. So there are bond funds, but typically the average bond fund investor is a retail investor, meaning uh, you don't work with a professional, you're not licensed and you're not a bank. So that's you sitting at home at the kitchen table or at your desk or at your office and you're plugging away, making trades. And that's who those people are. I Thank hope that you. answered the question. Thank you. Yep. So here's the, uh, the Dow Jones. Again, everybody hears of the Dow Jones industrials, right? So let's look at the types of decline. You have pullback, corrections, and then a bear market, right? So the different types of pullback, in other words, the decline, the different types of decline that you experience and the magnitude, how much it will pull back and how often that might happen. Now understand that this is not an exact science. This is based on past performances. There's no guarantee as to what it will do in the future. But when you're investing, you always consider what past performances were as a possibility for repeat occurrences. And you have technical people that look at charts and they see it, well, it went up this long, it went down this long, went up this long, down this long, and et cetera. So what this is saying is that if you have a pullback, typically you'll see a decline in the market of five, 10, five to 10%. That you will see at an approximately three times per year. Correction is 10 to 20% decline. And that you usually see one time a year. And a bear market is 20% or more decline and the bear market, which is, this is not true because it says once every four years. So historically, since they started tracking this, it's average every four years, but we haven't had a bear market in over 10 years. So, you know, we've been in a bull market since that long. So that's why you can't, it's not an exact science. And again, these are reasons why you work with someone who understands these and that can help coach you to make decisions while you're investing. Um, but you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, trying to time the market, we say, you know, you can't catch a falling knife. If you try to catch a falling knife, you're bound to get cut. And that's what happens when you try to time the market. If you are trying to maximize returns and wait for the market just before it goes down, and then you're going to sell right before it goes down, chances are you're going to lose out. This is a good indication of bull and bear markets. So the, the bull markets, meaning inclines, positive, strength, uh, the bull markets, if you are indicated in the light blue, the bear markets are indicated in the red. And if you look at the bull markets on an average, they've been 14 times stronger than the effect of the bear markets and longer. So, I mean, this is indicative that if you have a 10 year, 20 year period, you know, if you freak out and you sold, then you could lose out on a significant ability to earn back your money. So this is just indicative of how we've seen. And again, this is past performances, so you can't guarantee future experience, but it's a good indication. So investing regularly, like dollar cost averaging, meaning like everybody that has a 401k pretty much practices this discipline. You get paid, a little bit goes in. You get paid, a little bit goes in. And this is considered a disciplined investment strategy. If you're not saving in a 401k or you're saving outside of a 401k, you know, let's say you have $10,000. Do you go in buy $10,000 worth of stock today? Probably not a good idea. Why? because there is market volatility. The price is gonna go up, the price is gonna go down, the price is gonna go up, the price is gonna go down. So it's like if you had a, an empty tank of your car in gas and you know the volatility, you can drive down the street and you can get multiple prices of gas just driving down the street. If you were to fill your tank up at multiple gas stations different times, you would pay a different price per gallon. And if you did that, you would probably average a lower price per gallon than you would have if you filled it up at one gas station. And that's the principles with dollar cost averaging. It's not putting all your eggs in at one time. Dollar cost averaging means that you take a little bit of your money, you buy in today. You buy in a little bit in, in the next period. Some people do it on a six month basis. Some people do it annually, but you want a dollar cost average because you want to spread that investment out over time. 
um, and you want to buy at different times in the market. We showed you the volatility, how it goes up and down. So you want to buy a little bit high, a little bit low, a little bit high, a little bit low, a little bit high, a little bit low. And like for people that, you know, if you're doing it monthly, you can see, you know, so you don't get stuck buying at the euphoria at the peak, and then you're about to go down and then the market goes down and now you freak out and you sell. So buying it at different times allows you to buy, uh, uh, typically have better, you get more shares or, or more uh, stocks if you did it over time than at one particular time. Again, I have to say this, it doesn't guarantee profit and it doesn't guarantee uh, protection against loss, but that is considered uh, a, a disciplined investment strategy. So an annual average return to the S&P, take a look at this, right? And my next slide coming up is, is I think it's the next one or the one after is, is, I love that slide, but take a look at this and, and look at if, you know, look at how many times are in the blue and the average return of the blue versus the red. The red are the losses, the blue are the gains, right? And notice that with the exception of the Great Depression in 1975, the 2000, like 1999, 2000s, there really hasn't been consecutive years of decline within the S&P 500, right? So, I mean, there, there, those are periods in time that affected us uh, greatly. And, um, you know, we saw recessions um, back all the way to the depression. But you, the one thing I want you to know is that there are more sunny days than cloudy days, and it's indicative of this chart. Speaking of this the sunny days, we do have, do have a question about that. Sure, go ahead. Um, Julia wanted to know if you invest in stock and you elect to have your dividends reinvested, do you have to report any of this income or gain loss on your portfolio annually? Yeah, so dividends are considered income as ordinary income. It's not considered capital gains. But dividends being reinvested, you are taxed on annually because it increases your basis. So for an example, when you receive a dividend and you reinvest those dividends, you're buying more stock. So the basis is how much you paid for the stock. So as you're buying stock, it's that price that you paid, that's the point where they look at the taxation. So if the stock goes up, then that's capital gains, right? So the dividend you earn, if you're buying more stock, whatever you price that, whatever the price that is, whatever you got paid, that becomes your new basis for capital gains. So you receive it and it's taxed as ordinary income, uh, dividend income, but it's, it, so yeah, you are taxed on dividends, whether you receive it in, 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 in your hand or you're buying new investments. But the good thing is that as you buy more stock with your dividends, that basis is being established for that stock. So if you have capital gains, it's from the amount that you bought the stock at. If you lose money the same way you have capital losses, whether short-term or long-term, um, you know, that it's not going to offset the tax because capital gains tax and ordinary income tax are, are two different tax rates, depending on, you know, what your, your, your income is, et cetera. There are different levels of capital gains and whether or not you keep the investment for a year or more is also going to change the type of capital gains tax that you, you experience. So yeah, dividends are taxed as income on an annual basis, uh, you'll receive a 1099 for them, but it does create a basis for that investment. So whatever over that amount that you make will be later capital gains once you, you know, sell those positions. Um, or if you lose money and you sold and you realize the loss, that would give you, you know, a capital loss. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yep. So this is what I was trying to, this is one of my favorite slides. And, um, this is someone who invested from January of 99 to December for 20 years to 2019. Okay. If someone put $10,000 in the S and P 500 and they stayed fully invested, didn't touch the money, they would have earned 6.06%. Their, their account value would be worth $32,000. However, if they freaked out and sold at any particular time and they missed over 20 years, just 10 of the best days over the past 20 years, just 10 days out of all those days, they would have made half of that return. They would have made 15,390 was what their total balance would have been. Their, their, their return on their investment would have been 2.44%, missing just 10 of the best days. That's because they try to time the market, meaning they pulled the money out, but then the market shot back up and they lost all that growth opportunity. 
if they miss 20 days over the 20 year period, the 20 best days that the market had in the S&P 500 over the past 20 years, look, they barely made any money whatsoever. In fact, because of inflation, they are less than their initial investment. So if they played with their money, pulled it in and try to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell because of things that have happened over the 20 year period, they lost money. And if they missed 30 of the best days, and 30 days is one month out of 20 years, not a lot. But if you missed one month out of the market over 20 years, the, the best days, that is not consecutive days in a month, but 30 total of the best days, you lost money. Additionally, uh, your value is only $6,500. So who's the person that complains? The person that complains is the person that pulls the money in and out of the market and they see these negative returns. And that's because they did it themselves and they weren't advised and they panicked uh, and they didn't follow good principles. They didn't, they didn't realize what they were invested for and they try to time the market. And this slide is indicative. And this is fact. This is not hypothetical. This is fact. Um, based upon the dates, based upon actual returns, based upon the, an investment of $10,000. So let's look at going to the best days, right? How do you miss the best days? Well, let's look at Black Monday, dot-com bubble, the Great Recession. You know, I don't know the ages of people on here and, and what you've experienced in investing. Black Monday was in the 80s. I don't know how many people were, were you know, uh, investing in the 80s or remember that day. Uh, the dot-com bubble, you know, if you see the dot-com bubble, the market went down 43%, but yet one year later was up 29%. Five years later was up 95%. Imagine if people sold, they surrendered, they, they quit. When they lost money, they were down 43%. And they said, I waved the white flag. I can't take this anymore. I'm out of the market because I'm going to keep losing money. But yet they didn't think, well, I'm invested for the next 20 years. Well, they lost all of that upside. The Great Recession back in 2008, 2009, the market went down 54%. Look at the rebound in five years. The market was up 177%. So those people that freaked out and sold and took their money out of investments, they lost all of that opportunity to make that money back and some. Look at this year. I don't have a chart for it, but this year, if you freaked out and sold your investments in March because of the pandemic that struck and you saw the market crash, and you stayed out of the market, guess what? We had a tremendous rebound. You know, and there are clients of mine that, you know, look, the client's the boss. My job is to educate the client. My job is to give them advice. If they don't want to follow it, it's their money. I got to listen to them. But I have clients who didn't want to listen to me and they took their money and they put it in cash because they were afraid. They said, oh, we're, I don't want to lose any more money. I want to lose any more money. But when do you need the money for? Well, I don't know. Maybe in the long run, I don't know, but I don't want to lose any more money. It's hard. I get it. I invest too. It's hard to see your value go down. It's hard to see your money go down, but you have to trust in the principles. And those people that don't often pay a hefty price. This is a big wow. That was a real, you know, looking at that, it's just wow. So, you know, diversification, we talked about dollar cost averaging, knowing what your time horizon is, but diversification is also key. You know, Diversification is a result of your risk tolerance um, and your time horizon and what your goals are. So people often have a 401k, an IRA, maybe they have five, uh, 529 plans, maybe they have a, a brokerage account somewhere and you know they're invested in mutual funds and mutual funds generally have an objective that they're trying to achieve um, you know, and there are many different types, but they all have different names. Fidelity has them, American funds, you know, Merrill. I mean, so many companies out there, thousands of companies have mutual funds that they put together for people to invest into. And so you may be buying mutual funds and mutual funds could have hundreds or thousands of stocks in there. And just because you have a mutual fund with company A and company B, they have two different names with two different companies with two different names doesn't mean the underlying investments are not the same investments. So you may not be diversified, right? Um, understanding what your risk tolerance is. You know, if you're only willing to take so much risk, well, how much reward are you going to get? Uh, you know, you should never have more risk than what it's worth in reward and understanding the, the relationship there. You know, if you're willing to lose 10%, well, how much 
should you earn, if you're willing to lose 10%, you should earn more than what you can lose, right? But if you're only willing to lose 5%, well, then your ability to earn is typically less. Um, so that's your risk tolerance. But diversifying your portfolio so you understand where your assets are, um, number one, it's going to help you with volatility because the better diversified you are, you know, if tech, if technology is doing great or financials are doing, you know, one thing, you know, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket because if the market, if that particular sector in the market goes down, well, then you lose all of your money. But that's why you want to counterbalance it. And a lot of people do that with stocks and bonds. You know, they diversify between stocks and they diversify between bonds because they're supposed to be in an uh, inverse relationship with them which is also kind of out the window lately because bonds have been moving with stocks, but that's besides the point in another class. Um, but diversification is key. Asset allocation is also important. Um, you know, we just talked about this, stocks, bonds, cash, making sure you understand uh, what your allocation should be, safety versus risk, and, you know, rebalancing those. Um, let's go on to the next one. So this slide here kind of talks about the, the, the reason why you want to diversify in asset allocations. So if you look at the colors, right, let's just pick any color. I mean, I'm going to pick the dark blue um, because I think that's more prominent. And the dark blue is small cap value stocks, which means that they're undervalued, uh, small capitalized companies, small companies. So if you look at 2008, look at 2009, 2010, and follow it all the way over to 2019 and look how much it moved. So depending on when you need your money, that moved all over the place, right? Uh, the gold moved all over the place. So if you're diversified, it kind of helps to level those lines a little bit where you're not doing this, you know, every single year because things change, you know? Oil may not be the hottest ticket right now and it's not. Small caps have been doing really well. So you gotta know where your money's invested and why you're investing in it. And this will help you understand why having that diversification is important because you don't want to be in the same bucket and going those dramatic um, changes. This is fixed income bonds, uh, same principle, just showing you, you know, what, you know, yesterday's trash, today's treasure and vice versa. So the asset mix, right? We talked about equities and bonds. Typically people want bonds for safety, and you know, remove volatility. People like the equity stocks because it affords them the opportunity to make money return on their investment. So you may have heard, oh, I have a 60-40 mix, a 50-50 mix, 70-30, et cetera. You know, typically when we talk about retirement with clients, uh, you know, we talk about, all right, we're gonna put a person who is in their retirement, you know should probably be in a 70-30. Someone in retirement should be more conservative. Someone who's really young, probably not very, you know, not many stocks, uh, excuse me, not many bonds, but mostly stocks. If you have in your 401k what they call target date funds, target date funds are like, they'll say the 2040 fund. The 2040 fund is a good example of this and what they do. So if you're gonna retire 2040, right now that's 20 years away, you're probably gonna see a higher allocation in stocks because you have 20 years to go. But as you get closer to that 2040 period, they're going to transfer the assets inside of that fund to be more, um, you know, the opposite where you're going to have more bonds and less equities because they want to be safer. They want to make the money safer as you get closer to retirement. Um, but understanding this and understanding how you're invested is important because you may have a balanced fund that has 50-50 and then you might buy a bond fund. So if you buy a bond fund and you buy a balanced fund, you may have too many bonds in your portfolio. Uh, so it's important to know what the underlying investments are. That's actually, we had a question specific to that. Someone who is an octogenarian wanted to know what the best balance was. So um, of stocks and bonds. Yeah, so there's not, again, it, it really, you know, when it comes to investing, uh, any advice is given based upon the individual. So um, what's most important is that, you know, we have to determine A, what your risk tolerance is, B, what your time horizon is, um, and what your needs are. Uh, and then there's a conversation to be had there. So there's not a specific uh, amount that, um, you know, you should have as a blanket. You know, I'm not one of these people that speak about, oh, everybody should do this and everybody should do that. So, you know, understand that it's important that you understand these principles 
but your specific needs are specific to you and, and will require more in-depth conversation to understand. Um, I went ahead and uh, shared your contact information in the chat function for everyone, just so sure. you Thank could you. ask specific questions. So this is important because, you know, someone earlier asked about dividends, right? And someone and talked about reinvesting dividends. And that was a great question. So imagine if you started off with a 65% stock portfolio and a 35% bond portfolio. I talk to people all the time that haven't looked at their portfolio or looked at anything or made any changes over years. And they think, oh, it's doing fine. I don't have to worry about it. Well, check this out. If someone was in 65% stocks when they first started, let's say 1992 per the, 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 this diagram here, uh, this chart, if they had 65% chart uh, in stocks and they did nothing, they didn't rebalance, they didn't change anything, and they reinvested their money, in 1999, they had 82% in stocks. Why? Because the money, the dividends they earned bought more stock, right? In 2006, it was at 78%, 2007, 62%. And then 2019, they were 85% in stocks. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem is that if you have a specified amount of risk that you're willing to take, you have to rebalance your portfolio so that your portfolio is only exposed to a certain amount of risk. So if your portfolio, if your, if your risk tolerance calls that you should be in a 65% stock and a 35% bond portfolio, well, you need to revisit your portfolio to make sure that A, that you are properly allocated so that you're achieving the risk reward in the stocks, right? You're achieving what you want to achieve in stocks, but at the same time, you have money in the bonds where you want it to be a little bit safer, right? So you have to rebalance your portfolio. And so many people don't do that. They just think that, oh, my portfolio is doing fine. That's great. But look at night, look at this. When that when this person had 82% equities, if they were not a risky person, well, they were taking on way too much risk than they should be, because they should only be taking risk with 65% of their portfolio. And I'm not saying bonds are not risky because you can lose money in bonds, but they're a lot less risky. Um, and therefore, that's why people buy them because of the reduced amount of risk as opposed to equities. But this is why it's important that you revisit your portfolio and understand how you're allocated and make sure that you're maintaining your allocation. Because if this person is 82% equities, they're taking out way more risk than they want. And if there's a downturn in the market, they can lose a lot more money than they wanted to lose because they took a lot more risk than they should be in. But so often people don't take a look at it. They just look at the balance. Oh, my balance is going up. It looks good. My balance is going up. That's not disciplined and that's not being a smart investor. So this just talks about, um, you know, if someone, I, 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 don't worry about the uh, chart on your left, look at the right, right? So look at these three uh, things that uh, affected the market, the dot-com bubble, the great recession, the two items, right? Dot-com bubble, great recession. So if someone was all equities during these um, times, during a dot-com bubble, if they were all equities, they lost 42%. But if they mitigated that risk by buying bonds and allocating, you know, a 60, 40, where 60% were equities and 40% were bonds. They only lost 17% because there was 60, 40, right. Versus being all equity. So going back to the slide before someone who's 85, 82%, 85% equities, and they should be at 60, 40. Well, they're going to lose a lot more money as we were talking about. And this example shows that. So someone who was in a 60, 40 mix, basically save themselves just under 25% market losses. So the difference was almost 25% between being uh, having it allocated between bonds and, and equities versus being all equity. The Great Recession, look, 54%, right? If they were allocated 60, 40, they would have only lost 33%. Again, saving themselves 20%. If you didn't lose, if you saved that, you know, that amount, if your account value went down that less, of a percentage, I'm sure you would have felt better about that. But that's why understanding your allocation, understanding, uh, you know, and rebalancing that is, is ultimately important for these types of instances. Uh, this is just showing you um, all equity. Again, um, this is using uh, the growth of $10,000 using the S&P 500. 
uh, and the bond index. The other one I think was the Dow Jones. So we talked about a lot of things today and we talked about a lot of disciplines when it comes to investing. And the reality is that, you know, look, you can do it yourself. And I'm not here to try to sell you and say, call me so I can help you. Um, I don't try to sell people. It's just not my style. Um, I love helping people and I work with anybody. Um, but understand that you have to take responsibility and that responsibility means you need to do your due diligence before you make investment decisions. You're investing in your 401k because your, your, your work friends say, oh, I did this in my 401k. So everybody does that, the water cooler talk. Or you're, you know, I hear a lot of times people say, well, my brother is doing this and my brother does that and my brother works on Wall Street. So he told me I should do this. Well, your brother's not you. Did your brother take the time to really understand the principles? Did he do a risk tolerance questionnaire? You know, is he rebalancing your portfolio? What I'll say is that you are you and you are specific. Your needs are specific. The way you feel about things are specific and you can't do what everybody else does. Unfortunately, you know, the herd mentality doesn't work. And it is, you know, that that is a term, a herd mentality, meaning everybody does the same thing. Um, so understand you gotta be disciplined. So whether that's speaking to someone or truly learning yourself, and taking you know, time to learn how to be a disciplined investor will save you a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress, especially in times like today where we're seeing a great amount of volatility. So the key takeaways from today's presentation, don't let your emotions get the best of you. Focus on the long-term, understand what you are invested for and when you need the money. Invest regularly. Don't say, well, the market's high or the market's low. It, Follow your course, stay the course, right? Stay the course. Um, you know, if it starts raining, do you turn your car around and go home? No, you, you maybe go a little slower, but you stay the course. Um, diversify, it's, you know, making sure that you're properly diversified and understanding how your diversification works and rebalancing, you know, understanding what your allocation should be and then making sure that you're maintaining those, uh, that asset allocation in your portfolio is important. So with that being said, uh, you know, my favorite time, and I always try to leave enough time. And I guess we have about 10 minutes to answer some questions. So please, if you have questions, fire away. It was great. We got an opportunity to ask some wonderful questions during the during your presentation. Um, but another question that came up was about COVID. And, yeah. you know, obviously, you can't speak specifically, because everyone is different. But generally, how has COVID affected investing? Um, is this Renee's question? Yes, it's a part of that, that question. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I'm sorry, Elizabeth, it, it, you, you, I lost you for a second. You said, how has COVID changed investing? Yeah. How, how has COVID affected or changed investing? Well, that's just it. So COVID shouldn't have changed investing. If anything, you want to be just conscious of what's going on. But, you know, if you're retiring in 40 years or 20 years or 30 years, are you necessarily worried about today? You know, if you're retiring in five years, are you worried about today? Well, yeah, you're probably a little bit more concerned. You know, if you're buying a house next year, are you worried about today? Yes, you are. But that's why, you know, I, look, all I can tell you is it's important that you speak to somebody that understands these things and what options you have. You know, you don't want to go running and selling things because, if you have a portfolio and you go and sell things, you can be creating a huge tax implication for yourself. You know, if you've made money and you sell, you could be you can be getting taxed on capital gains that you really don't want. So you think you're making money, but at the end of the day, you're paying capital gains tax or you're paying short-term gains tax. And at the end of the day, you're making a lot less money than you would have made if you would have just left it there. So, you know, sometimes it's best to just, you know, speak to somebody and kind of like, you know, I hate to say talk you off the ledge, but understand why you're invested. COVID should not have affected so many people from an investment perspective. Um, because honestly, if you needed the money this year or next year, you should have planned that last year and made the changes to kind of be in a better position. So through COVID, right? So maybe if you're in, if you're looking at three to five years from today, um, you know, maybe then uh, you know you want to look at now and say, okay, well. What's going to happen post-COVID, right? Where's the market going to go? I mean, look, 
I mean, you know, people were all freaked out about the election. The election came and went, and we saw like incredible gains, incredible loss. It's the same thing as last time. The crystal ball is broken. No one has a crystal ball. I love listening to the analysts on TV because they love to get the people's attention. But the, the fact is no one really knows, but that's why you have to be a disciplined investor and follow your principles. And if you do what you're supposed to do every single time, then you should be all right. But um, I just want to point to anyone over the age of 80, you know, that's a little hard to say, uh, Rini, because, you know, your particular goals, you know, 80 years old, are you going to live for another 20 years? Do you need income? Do you not need income? Are you planning on leaving a legacy behind? Do you plan on donating to charity? You know, there's so much to be said as far as, you know, any, any guidelines for anybody over 80. What I will say is if you're over 80 years old, you know, depending on how much money you have in the marketplace, that really should dictate. And again, based upon what your future goals are, you know, if your future goals are legacy and you don't need the money, well, then it becomes a personal decision. Do you want to take more risk or less risk? You know, are you trying to leave more behind or less behind? But if you have a lot of money and you're over 80, you really should be looking at estate planning and realizing, you know, who is going to benefit from what type of account? Because different beneficiaries uh, will, you know, do better with different types of, um, you know, inheritances. So it all depends on your, your particular situation. But, you know, when you're over 80, that's, uh, again, you got to look at you, what the money is going to be used for and when the money is going to be needed. And, you know, again, it, there's not really an age barrier. It's the same principles, just, you know, where you are in your personal life. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Yep. Um, Miriam wanted to know, what is in UTMA account? How does it work? Sure. Yeah, so a uniform transfer to minors. Uh, basically, what it does is it's an account that's owned um, kind of like an astodi a custodian account that assets go into for the benefit of children and it kind of holds it there for them um there are you know risks there you know depending on what you put in there could cause tax for the kids kitty tax uh could you know and kitty tax is the same as the same tax rate as your tax so parents used to transfer money to the kids or buy investments under the kids names because they they thought the kids wouldn't pay tax so you know, UTMA generally is an account or like a trust, if you will, set up for children under 18 uh, to preserve the money so that later on they have access to it. But that's what it is, um, how it works. I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons that come to it. So I don't want to get too much into the weeds about it. But essentially, UTMA is an account that's set up on the benefit of a minor and it holds the money in, a, in an account. Um, and you know, uh, you know, depending on what's in there, it, it could be a really bad thing or it could be a really good thing. So it just depends. Okay. Thank you. What, for someone who's starting out and, and thinking about working with a financial advisor, I mean, what, what is it like working with you when someone comes to you? Like, what is, you know, step one, step two, you know, how does that work? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm a big, big, big believer in relationships. And so for me, you know, the initial conversation is just getting to know one another. You know, when you're working with a financial advisor, financial planner, it's like any other engagement, right? You don't want to go to your doctor if you don't like your doctor. I mean, who wants to go see their doctor if they don't like them, right? I mean, you're going to find another doctor to work with. So it's kind of the same way. I mean, you want to work with somebody that's good, that knows their stuff, that's educated, but also you want to work with someone that understands you, someone that you can build a relationship with, because if you're looking to work with a financial planner, you want someone that you can relate to and you feel has your best interest in mind. So when you first start out, it's just a conversation. Sometimes people think they need a financial advisor and they really don't. It's just a matter of a question or two and we can help them. Other people, you know, it's ironic. Some people say, oh, I don't need a financial planner. But the reality is that, you know, if you were going to plan to drive from New York to California, would you just get in the car and drive? Or would you take the time out to research it on a map and put in the GPS to follow the course? So, I mean, it's the same scenario. If you're planning financially and for a particular goal or investments, um, are you going to go at it kind of like randomly and hope it all works out? Or do you want to map it out and do an analysis and be able to track it and monitor it and make changes, et cetera? You know, it's like your health, right? The same thing going back to a doctor. Um, you know, if you go on WebMD or Google, I swear anything leads to, you know, the most horrific outcomes. And, and you know, it, it's like everybody, you got a splinter and, you know, it's going to lead to some horrific, 
you know, uh, medical diagnosis that you freak out over and then you call your doctor and they're like, don't worry, it's a splinter. But um, so that's why you go to your doctor because your doctor understands you. They understand how your anatomy works. They understand how you react to medications. They know your body. They can give you advice based upon you. And that's what's most important that you want to work with someone that understands you and has your best interest at heart um, and someone you can build a relationship with. For me, when I pick, when I work with clients, it's because we have that relationship. We share values. I don't want to work with a client that, you know, doesn't, that we just don't, you know, work well together because it's not going to be a good relationship. So I said, that's first and foremost. Um, and I think that the rest is kind of like easy to get into because once you have that relationship and understanding, then you kind of work on your goals and then you create a, a roadmap to reach your goals and then you monitor it and et cetera. And that kind of just goes on from there. Thank you. Yeah. What, what is the difference and what is the designation when you, being a certified financial planner? What is that designation? It means that I studied a really, really long time and <laughs> I passed a very, very long test. Uh, no, the certified financial planner, the CHFC chartered financial consultant, when you see these designations, it's just an indication that the person has been committed to their profession. You know, it's kind of like a CPA versus an accountant, right? You can be an accountant and you can do accounting work or you can take the, you know, the initiative to do more training, more understanding um, and become a CPA and you're a certified public accountant. You know, if you, you need documents to be, you know, authenticated, typically they're going to require a certified uh, public accountant, a CPA, not just an accountant. So when you're working with a CFP, it just means that, you know, I've taken a lot of different classes, um, experience, you have to have uh, 6,000 hours, I believe in experience, um, you have to have a college degree. Um, so, you know, working with the CFP just basically means that the person has taken the time out and dedicated themselves uh, to their profession. Um, and therefore, you know, and more comprehensive, right? Like as a certified financial planner, you know, everything from property and casualty to estate to business to insurance, I mean, the, the, the list is endless. So it just, it's just a level of integrity, a level of ethics, and a level of knowledge that you have when you have these designations. So it's just a commitment to the job, to, to doing what you do. Terrific. Thank you so much. Well, honestly, we could be asking you questions all night, but uh, <laughs> it's getting dark <laughs> and I want to respect your time and, and everyone who's joined us. But thank you so much, Jay. You really enlightened so many of us and helped us to, to understand what we need to know about investing. And yeah. we've gotten a lot of comments from the attendees saying thank you and yeah. um and, and, and feeling that they've learned a lot. Yeah. And thank you so much to our attendees. We really appreciate your spending some time with us this evening. Um, I will, you will get an email after this and we will have Jay's contact information there too, if you'd like to reach out to him. Um, additionally, you'll be able to see this webinar again and share with your friends because it was recorded. And um, we will share that link with you as well. And um, so thank you for being here and enjoying our time together. Again, thank you, Jay. And I wish you all a wonderful evening and wishing you all to stay safe and stay healthy. Yes. So Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.